at Triathlon Show, episode 73. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I talk to Stefan Guyane, who is a PhD and the author of the book The Hungry Brain, and we will discuss overeating and how it is our brain that is behind us eating more than we should, why this happens, and what we can do to prevent it. But first, I'm very, very excited to announce that that triathlon show is sponsored by Precision Hydration. You might have heard Andy Blow, who is the founder of Precision Hydration, on episode 49 of the show, when we talked about hydration, electrolytes, and cramping. And if you haven't, do go back and listen to that episode, because it's really, really great, and you'll learn a ton that you can use in your triathlon racing and other races as well. And you might also have heard episode uh, 63, where I discussed the swim run, Finnish swim run national championships that uh, me and my partner Simon Briley won, and how I used the precision hydration products to fuel that win with uh, knowing that electrolytes are really, really crucial in long duration races like that. So uh, that's a great, great uh, piece of news. And uh, do go and take precision hydrations free, very quick and easy online sweat test on precisionhydration.com, which I'll link to in the show notes that are right there in your podcast app and on that triathlonshow.com. So uh, yeah, just go and take that sweat test. And if you want to buy any other products, including electrolyte drinks, capsules or similar, then use the discount code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps for 15% off So just to expand a little bit, since this is the first sponsored episode that I have, uh, what it it means for the show is that uh, it really makes it much more sustainable as up until now. I've just been throwing money at uh, making this podcast with hosting, audio editing software and whatnot, other help that I've needed from time to time with uh, with web hosting and things like that. Things come up and it costs some money. So... This makes the show much more sustainable economically. Also, of course, it it is good to know that I can justify making this podcast a little bit financially as well as from a passion perspective, of course, which I, I always have and always can. But I do spend countless hours every week getting these podcasts out there. So so it's uh, nice to to have some sustainability to it now. And uh, I definitely want to say that I will never accept a sponsor that I can't 100% stand behind and endorse personally. Precision Hydration is absolutely a company like that. Uh, I have really enjoyed talking to Andy and his team uh, in the podcast interview run-up and after that as well, and uh, for some tips when I was preparing for the Olympic Distance Nationals as well, and the swim run, of course. So yeah, it's, it's a company that is great. They are constantly over delivering just look at their blog or their twitter feed with all their q and a's that uh, you can just ask them any personal question that you have there and uh, it's pretty evident that they are a company built on over delivery which i really really admire and something that i strive for myself as well all right so today's interview or interviewee Stefan Guyane has a long background in obesity research. He has a PhD in neurobiology from the University of Washington, and he currently works as a writer, speaker, and science consultant. He's the author of The Hungry Brain, Outsmarting the Instincts That Makes Us Overeat. And that is the main topic of today's interview. We will base the interview off of that book, which I've just finished reading, and it's amazing really fascinating he's also the co-designer of a web-based fat loss program called ideal weight which we'll link to in the show notes and he is a contributor to the highly reputable source of nutrition research translated from scientist lingo examine.com all right let's get right into the interview 
All right, so today I'm very happy to welcome Stefan Guianet to That Triathlon Show. Welcome, Stefan. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. Good to be here, Michael. Nice. So you are the author of the book The Hungry Brain. We're just talking off air. I just finished it yesterday, and I, I really think it's a very, very good book. Fascinating, brilliant, uh, very enticing. Can you describe the book in thirty seconds or so? Like, what will a potential reader learn from it? Yeah, so I've been uh, really struck by the large gap between uh, scientific research on obesity and eating behavior and what the public knows about obesity and eating behavior. And so this is basically my attempt to bridge that gap. And in particular, it focuses on the fact that the brain generates all behaviors and all feelings and all impulses. And so it's obviously a key um, perspective to take when thinking about eating behavior and obesity. So I'm trying to understand the brain circuits that drive us to overeat, even though we don't want to overeat conscious, consciously or rationally. And in the book, you talk about these brain circuits belonging to two different systems, one that is uh, fast and uh, non-conscious, and uh, a second that is slow and conscious and more rational, shall we say, and you talk a lot about why system one, the fast and non-conscious thinking, is what makes us overeat. And now we're obviously talking to a triathlete audience, but uh, I don't think that makes us any less susceptible to, to overeating, at least for what many consider would be what they'd like to do. Many triathletes are concerned with getting to their race weights and might find that difficult just because they're ravenous all the time and and things like that so so let's start to to uncover why these two different systems or i should say probably the non-conscious thinking more so makes us overeat can you dive into that from an overview perspective first yeah absolutely so the human brain, if you look at how it's organized, it's um, it's kind of organized according to a couple of different uh, overlapping or related principles, I should, I should say. So closest to the brainstem, you have the least conscious, the closest to the spinal cord, I should say, you have the least conscious, most automatic functions, things that regulate digestion and... Um, breathing and heart rate and that sort of thing. And those circuits are really kind of hardwired. Those are not circuits that have a lot of flexibility. If they lose function, there's not like other circuits that can take over for them. Um, those things are, those functions are really hardwired. And then as you progressively move to evolutionarily more recent parts of the brain, as you get further away from the spinal cord and closer to the cerebral cortex, you progressively get um, two functions that are uh, progressively more conscious and progressively more flexible, in other words, less hardwired. And so you get to circuits that regulate emotions and stress. You get to circuits that regulate uh, stability or homeostasis of a bunch of different functions, such as uh, temperature and body fatness. And then eventually you get all the way up to the circuits that are the most flexible and the least hardwired uh, and the most influenced by what happens to you over the course of your life. And that's the things in the cerebral cortex. And the, these, I mean, the cerebral cortex is an incredibly homogenous tissue. If you look at it, it its structure is very much the same over most of its um, volume, but it performs all these different functions really as a function of its software, I would say, rather than its hardware. And if one thing gets damaged, other parts can compensate. So it's not really this hardwired tissue. So that's, that's kind of like a general overview of the hierarchy of the brain and how uh, tasks are divided up. But obviously, there are different levels of that organization that can be relevant to the same or similar behaviors. So, for example, if you're trying to make a decision about uh, what to eat, you might have parts of your brain that are very ancient and impulsive that say, wow, I recognize that food. That's got lots of sugar and fat. And so I'm going to trigger your motivational, I'm going to trigger your intrinsic motivation, your craving, or maybe I'll tr trigger your energy-seeking pathways, your hunger. 
Um, but then you might have these higher level, more flexible circuits that say, whoa, wait a minute, this eating this food is not consistent with my higher level goals of physical performance in my triathlon or uh, maintaining my shapely figure for being in a bathing suit this summer or not wanting to get diabetes or whatever. And so you have these higher order, more uh, sophisticated, flexible circuits that have different goals than sometimes have different goals, I should say, than those lower, uh, more impulsive, more hardwired circuits. And, and that's kind of, you can't really draw like maybe not a completely clean line between so-called system one and system two, uh, system one being those more hardwired functions, system two being the more flexible ones. Um, but I think it's a useful division to take. And that's one that uh, Daniel Kahneman, the uh, Nobel laureate who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow, really helped educate me on. And ba so basically, you have this opposition that can often happen between these two circuits. And this really, it, I think this is really what drives overeating and obesity is the, f is the fact that you have these uh, Im impulsive, non-conscious or minimally conscious circuits that are receiving cues from our environment, from our crazy modern food environment and from inside our bodies that are telling you to eat more food. And that may not be consistent with your conscious goals about what you want to do, but it nevertheless is a very powerful force. And it's not something that it's very easy to fight on a continual basis. And that's true for anyone who has tried to lose weight, whether it's for sports or whether it's for health and physical appearance or whatever. Um, you know, I, I've experienced this too. When I was in high school, I used to be a wrestler and uh, wrestling sometimes involves trying to make weight. And so, and especially in the context of extraordinarily high physical activity levels, it's really hard to cut back on your food intake. I mean, your brain tells you in no uncertain terms that it does not want you to do that. Um, and these are very deeply wired responses because they kept our ancestors alive and fertile. And so, um, yeah, so that's really the fundamental struggle that I think is happening in the modern world between these two different types of brain systems and I think the evidence suggests, and I'm talking about the evidence that we're getting fatter, suggests that the uh, so-called system one or the more impulsive, less conscious circuits tend to be winning that struggle. Yeah, and an interesting thing that I noticed as I was going through your book is that the more I, I read, the more I realized that just being aware of these things and uh, how you unconsciously can make decisions uh, that might be not necessarily on in line with what you would like to do like as a triathlete you would like to have a really good uh, good nutrition high quality nutrition all the time and and just knowing these things that you the examples that you talk and how evolution has made us choose make cer certain food choices that already in itself makes it quite a bit easier actually to stick to those those goals that are conscious that are from the from the fast uh slow thinking system the the more modern areas of the brain so that was uh, interesting to me to know this so what you start with in in the book in terms of these different uh hardwired concepts is uh the reward system for food and how that affects us overeating can you go into that a bit yeah absolutely so you know i i like to i i think natural selection is is really like the highest level most general lens that i like to apply to some of these systems because i think it makes sense out of a lot of these things that might not otherwise make sense um and if we apply natural selection to uh foraging behavior like the foraging behavior of our ancestors what we see is that um to have a successful organism that can have a high level of reproductive success, which is the currency of natural selection, you need to have an animal that can efficiently acquire energy from its surroundings. So, um, and that energy isn't, you know, energy is a concept that refers to uh, potential energy stored in chemical bonds, but that is stored in specific types of chemical bonds. And to seek that energy effectively, 
you have to go after certain substances that contain those specific types of chemical bonds. So we're talking about carbohydrate, fat, and protein primarily. And so if you're natural selection and you're trying to design an organism to be really good at passing on its genes in a natural environment, you're going to design an organism that is motivated by specific chemical properties in food that are markers of its energy content. And that is particularly protein, carbohydrate, and fat. And so, and that's exactly how we're wired. Not just humans, but many other animals, most other animals. Uh, we have specific receptors in our digestive tract that recognize protein, carbohydrate, and fat. So, and the carbohydrate includes sugar and starch. And we have special receptors for glutamate, which is an amino acid that signals uh, protein, especially cooked protein. Um, and essentially those things communicate to the brain and they cause certain parts of the brain, such as the ventral tegmental area to, uh, release dopamine, or I should say cell bodies in the ventral tegmental area release dopamine into the ventral striatum or nucleus accumbens. And when dopamine gets released in the ventral striatum, that's a really key event in our motivation and our learning to be motivated. So basically, when your brain gets, gets the message that what you just ate has a bunch of protein and carbohydrate and fat, and, and by the way, the dopamine release is proportional to the concentration of those nutrients in the food. When your brain gets that I message... If I can inter interrupt here, that, that's a key point that you make, that the concentration and the density of, of those uh, macronutrients is important because obviously a tomato is uh, carbs, but it's uh, very, very not concentrated. So, so it doesn't cause that same big spike in dopamine and, and the reinforcing behavior as something like an ice cream or whatever that it has both carbs and fats in very concentrated amounts would, would cause. Yes, absolutely. And so your, your brain is basically monitoring the composition of your food via your digestive tract by paying attention to these chemical receptors in your digestive tract. And it's saying, how well does the composition of this food line up with the things that I'm looking for, the things that the brain is hardwired to look for in food which are the things that, are, that kept our ancestors alive. And so when a food is very concentrated in carbohydrate, fat, and protein, you get a lot of dopamine release, and that causes you to be motivated on a very basic intuitive level, which we call a craving, uh, to eat that food. So if you have begun to eat it, you will be motivated to continue to eat it, and uh, Furthermore, it causes you to learn all the sensory cues that are associated with those nutrients. So if you eat ice cream, using your example, all that dopamine gets released and that causes your brain to remember the appearance of the ice cream, the flavor of the ice cream, where you ate it, who you were with, the texture of it, everything about it, all of the sensory cues that predict the availability of that big delivery of nutrients, those become motivational cues themselves. And so the next time you see the box of ice cream or the next time you smell it or have a little taste or whatever, it gets your dopamine spiking again and it pushes you to consume that food. And again, that dopamine release and that learning process is proportional to the concentration of nutrients. And this is very analogous to how drugs of abuse work where if you are smoking cigarettes or taking heroin or whatever, the reason those are addictive is because they cause dopamine release, which causes you to learn that cigarette smoke and the box of cigarettes and the people that you smoke cigarettes with are motivational triggers that make you crave, and it's very difficult to say no. The reason drugs of abuse share the same mechanism is because they essentially hijack that pathway. They act on this pathway that evolved to help us seek food and sex and everything else that kept our ancestors successful. Um, so anyway, that's, that's basically how reward works. And if you look at, sorry, that's how food reward looks, um, works. And if you look at the properties of ancestral diets, the diets of our distant ancestors, they 
tended to be less rewarding. So they were unrefined, which means that they were higher in、uh, fiber, higher in water compared to modern foods. In our modern diets, we purify fats to a pure state and add it to foods. We purify sugar to a pure state. We purify glutamate to a pure state. Monosodium glutamate purify salt. So basically, we're like distilling out these reward factors, the active ingredients that spike dopamine, and mixing them together in ways that are way more stimulating than what our ancestors had. And so, while they didn't have the ability to refine foods like that and to concentrate the rewarding active ingredients, today we do, and we do that readily. And foods like that surround us, and so, and we're accustomed to them. And so, it's very difficult at that point to. Say no to that motivational trigger that is pushing us to eat those very, very seductive foods, and in some people that can lead to actual frank、uh, addictive-like behavior. In the rest of us, it just makes us eat too much. You have a very good example in the book.、Uh, on that note, on、uh, how the coca leaves, in their purest concentrated form, as cocaine is.、Uh... A very very addictive substance, obviously, but the coca leaves themselves that are、uh, chewed, I believe, in、uh, some parts of of South America, they're they're not as addictive. And、uh, just to punch a hole here, and I know this is a loaded question, especially it's all over media, but but in the endurance sports world, this this is a hot hot topic right now. I think you've already mentioned it, but just to give us a quick answer, is there a difference between Sugar or fat, in terms of which uh, is uh, the biggest bandit here,、uh, in uh, which is、uh, the biggest food reward factor for us, or is it、uh, both are equally evil? Yeah, I think there's a lot of、um, uncertainty that remains. So I don't necessarily want to say with confidence that they're precisely equal, but I think I can say with confidence that they are both very powerful reward factors. And you know, people. <clears throat> it's interesting to read these articles about people saying they're addicted to sugar and then cutting out sugar and losing weight and feeling like they have better control over their eating habits. I, I have no doubt that those reports are accurate, but I think if you look more closely, what you see is that the sweet foods that they're cutting out often are not. They're almost never pure sugar. I mean, nobody digs into a bowl of pure granulated white sugar. It's not that appealing.、Um, but the foods that they're cutting out are things like brownies and cookies and ice cream and chocolate and things that generally are sugar and fat. And if you look at the foods that people report as being、um, most commonly associated with cravings and addiction-like behavior. Generally, they're either combinations of sugar and fat, or they're combinations of、uh, fat and starch, or fat and protein and salt, and so kind of like the savory high fat or the sugary high fat. But things that are just high in sugar and not in anything else don't are not associated with as frequent cravings or addiction like behavior. Not to say that no one experiences that, but it's less common. Um, so, I think that they're both very powerful reward factors, and I think, you know, you can cut refined sugar out of your diet, and most people will probably benefit from that in part because you're cutting out a lot of calorie dense, highly palatable, fattening foods.、Um, but I think you could just as easily turn around and say, "Well, I'm going to cut all added fat out of my diet," and I think people would find if they did that that they would have very similar effects. If they cut out added fat and everything that it's the, everything that contains it, I think they would find a that it's very difficult to do so because they're accustomed to it. They're they are accustomed to it. They want it. They like it, just like sugar. And also that it tends to associate with a lot of calorie dense processed foods, and cutting it out will tend to reduce your calorie intake and your、uh, overall drive to eat. Yeah, the potato diet that you have in the book is a good example of of the latter, where、uh, somebody 
decided to live off of just potato- potatoes. So it was 20 or something potatoes per day that he would be eating and actually lost quite a bit of weight, which uh, for him wasn't e- even the goal. It just happened. Let's just quickly cover the uh, economics of eating uh, because we have a lot of things to cover still. So let's maybe brush over this a bit more cl- quickly. But uh, the optimal foraging theory, OFT, what is that? Yeah, so this is a discipline that was developed uh, by biologists in, I I think, at least 50 years ago, maybe before that, to model the foraging behavior of wild animals. So they're basically trying to understand what are the principles that determine food selection and consumption in wild animals. And what they came up with is that And by the way, they did this in non-human animals first. Uh, And what they came up with was the finding that energy or calories or joules is the most important um, factor in food selection for most species, for most omnivorous species that could choose between many different foods. So basically, if you just model food selection behavior simply based on the calorie value of everything in the environment, you'll get a pretty decent picture of what what an animal will select in real life. And so, um, and that's pretty extraordinary because, and it's really not obvious because, you know, an animal like humans, we need many different nutrients to be healthy. It's not just about calories, yet apparently natural selection pays very close attention to calories and that's really a key if not the key limiting factor in the survival and reproduction of of wild species and so if you look at um you can actually boil this down to a very simple equation and that equation is the value of a food item equals the number of calories in that food item minus the number of calories it takes you to obtain and process it divided by time. And so it's just the calorie return rate. It's a very simple economics equation that you would apply to any type of investment you would make, any kind of financial investment um, that predicts foraging behavior. And it turns out to work in quote unquote wild humans, in other words, hunter gatherers as well. And so the human brain is really, really appears to be hardwired, not just humans, but many species appear to be hardwired to intuitively apply this economic equation to their food selection behavior. And so what you see is that one, you know, one thing you might predict from this is that if the value of a food is very high, in other words, if it contains a lot of calories, it requires very little time and effort to obtain and process and consume, then you would expect hunter-gatherers to take advantage of that situation and eat a lot of it. And that's exactly what they do. So anthropologists I interviewed described uh, hunter-gatherers chugging up to a liter of honey, uh, eating 30 wild oranges that are the same size and sweetness as supermarket oranges, um, eating five pounds of fatty meat. I mean, essentially, they become completely gluttonous when they have the opportunity to do so. And furthermore, it's good for them. This is a really key thing to understand is for our ancestors, gluttony was a good thing. There was no social stigma about overeating. It was a great thing. The more you could eat, the better. And the reason is that hunter-gatherers have fluctuating energy availability in their environment. They don't always get to eat as many calories as they want and they don't always get to eat as many calories as they want from the foods that they want and so when those things are available they take advantage of it and that helps their reproductive success by helping them build strong bodies by helping pregnant women come to term by being able to feed infants properly and give them enough calories and nutrition those things all increase survival and reproductive success and so, um, and so basically, those are the same things that are wired into our brains today, non-consciously. So we don't actively think about this. We're not doing these calculations. A rat or a lion or a raccoon 
is not doing these calculations consciously, but they are being made at some level in the brain, and that's affecting our food intake behavior. And so when we're in a situation where food is very easy to get, very convenient, very calorie dense, we have this, many of us, and of course this varies from person to person, but we have this uh, instinctive, impulsive drive to take advantage of it. I think a great example of that is free food. So like uh, in the United States here, I don't, I don't know if this is common where you are, but people will often bring food into work like brownies or pizza or donuts. They'll bring it into meetings and things. And so you'll have this very calorie dense food that's essentially right in front of you and costs you nothing in terms of money or effort. And it can be very hard to say no to that. And it can be very hard to overeat, even though you don't want to eat it. You know, it's unhealthy. You know, it's inconsistent with your conscious goals for yourself, but it can be very difficult to not do that. Yeah, it's uh, it's like an offer you can't refuse. Uh, it's a good deal. Uh, so yeah, that uh, that is a great explanation of that. And uh, the point here is, of course, that we still have those hardwired circuits in our brains that makes us do do these things that were good for us once upon a time, but not so much anymore. What about delay discounting? That was uh, an interesting point as well. And uh, if you can talk about the Stanford Marshmallow experiment, uh, that would be great, I think, for, for this uh, topic. Yeah, absolutely. So in the Stanford Marshmallow experiment, um, they essentially gave they they put kids in a room by themselves with a marshmallow and they said hey if you can go for 15 minutes I, i don't remember what the exact time was i don't remember the details but something like 15 minutes without eating this marshmallow we're going to come back in and we're going to give you two marshmallows and so and then they would measure uh whether the child would wait or whether they would eat the marshmallow, and if they did eat the marshmallow, how much of a latency period there was. So in other words, how much time it took before they ate the marshmallow. And what they found is that children who, the the longer they wait, almost all the kids, by the way, ate the marshmallow. <laughs> Very few of them waited for the second marshmallow. I think that's consistent with kids being, you know, very impulsive, but... Um, The longer they waited, the less, uh, the leaner they tended to be as adults. So basically, the more they valued a future reward in relation to an immediate reward, the more they, the less their weight crept over time. And this really gets at a concept called delay discounting because a lot of times, and this is the, the idea that we, discount or devalue things that are going to happen in the future to us relative to things that are happening right now. And so um, this is a really important concept because we often make decisions where some of the consequences of that decision are right now and some of them are later. And so uh, just to give a really simple example, if you're going to eat a cookie right now, The immediate benefit is the pleasure value and the reward value of it. You enjoy eating that cookie, but there's a delayed cost. And the delayed cost is that that cookie may take you one step closer to obesity and diabetes, cardiovascular disease, not fitting into your swimsuit next summer, et cetera, not winning your triathlon. So you're essentially having to make a decision between your current self and your future self, which one you value more. And um, most people, well, everyone values their current self more than their future self, but most people value their future self much less than their current self. And that leads to disastrous consequences. Um, You know, eating behavior is just one of them, but obviously uh, there are major financial consequences for that. People who can't control their spending Uh, or who gamble or things like that, those are people who are making a very destructive trade-off between their current well-being and their future well-being. They're essentially shortchanging their future selves. And so what we see is that people who have less delay discounting, in other words, who 
value their future self almost as much as their current self, they tend to do better across a variety of life outcomes, and body fat control is one of those things that they do better in. And this really makes sense because if you think about, like, it actually makes sense to value your future self less. Um, and the reason is that the future is uncertain, whereas the present is certain. So, you know, somebody might say, I'll give you 200 bucks in a year, but are they really going to do it? So, um, and in a hunter gatherer setting where our ancestors lived, or even uh, more recently in non uh, industrial agricultural settings, the future is very uncertain. I mean, you have a 50% chance of being dead by the time you're 35. So, you know, there's accidents, there's warfare, there's infectious disease. Uh, there isn't the same type of legal accountability um, that we have in modern societies. The future is very uncertain. And so it makes sense to have this intuitive impulse to greatly discount the future. And we've inherited that from our ancestors. But today it's different. We have very low mortality rates today. Um, we can, you know, put money away in a retirement account that we won't touch for 30 years. And that's actually a good idea. Um, and we can trust that it will be there as long as, you know, the economy doesn't collapse. And so there's this incredible stability in the modern world that we never had before that means it makes a lot more sense to value our future selves a lot more than we used to. But since that is uh, a kind of um, setting of the human brain that's kind of hardwired, it's not really something we apply consciously, it's kind of intuitive, it, it's built into us. And it caused, since we inherited that from our ancestors, it can lead to some pretty disastrous consequences, including overeating and obesity. Let's now talk about the lipostat and uh, also satiety because they tie into each other quite a bit. So uh, what uh, what is that and how does that affect our eating behaviors? Yeah, so there are basically two major systems that control um, the energy status of the body. And these are both situated in the brain. There's a short-term system that is in the brainstem that I call the satiety system. And this is something that responds, it regulates your energy status on a meal to meal basis. And basically what happens is that as you eat a meal, signals go up from your digestive tract to your brain and your brain gets information about what you ate. So the volume of it from stretch receptors in your stomach chemical composition from receptors in your small intestine and your mouth. So all this information gets integrated in your brainstem and the only, all this complex computation is happening. The only thing you're aware of is whether or not you feel full. That's the conscious output of the system. And that obviously ties into other systems that cause you to terminate your meal once you reach that state. So your motivational systems get turned off your motor systems stop driving your hand with the fork in it down to the plate. And uh, so um, that regulates your short-term energy status. What, what are the factors that uh, affect how uh, satiating of the type of food is uh, on, in this meal-to-meal -meal system? Yeah, so we have a pretty good idea of this. And I think this is very, very important and useful information. Um, Essentially, studies have been done showing that uh, not essentially the the how satiating or sating a food is is only loosely related to the number of calories it contains. So you can kind of trick your satiety system into feeling more full with fewer calories if your food has specific properties. And so that includes food that has a lower calorie density. So fewer calories per weight or volume. So like that would be oatmeal versus crackers, for example. Oatmeal has a lot more water and more fiber. And so the same number of calories will fill you up more. Um, food that is less palatable. So the more, the more delicious the food is, the less it fills you up per unit calorie. Um, and higher fiber and higher protein 
fill you up more per unit calorie. And so uh, essentially foods, any kind of food that we intuitively recognize as fattening, like ice cream or candy bars or pizza or chips or whatever, they invariably have physical and chemical properties that mean that they lead to less satiety per calorie. So they have um, typically low fiber, high calorie density, high palatability, sometimes low protein, not always. Um, and basically what that means is that it requires more calories, it requires you to eat more calories before you reach that point of satiety that causes you to terminate your meal. And so, and conversely, foods that are more ancestral and that we think of as more slimming, like whole unrefined foods, potatoes and vegetables and fruits and meats and eggs and things like that, those are on the opposite side of the spectrum where they have properties that provide greater satiety per calorie. So it, it kind of makes sense, I think, of a lot of intuitions we have about food. So then um, the other system is uh, the energy homeostasis system or lipostat, um, I think is a, is a good, good term for it. Um, and that is, so just to break down that word, it's kind of like thermostat in your home. Uh, thermostat is basically the two parts of those words mean thermal stability. And so the lipostat is body fat stability. And essentially what this system does is it regulates your body fatness which is your long-term energy status. So you have that short-term regulation happening in the brainstem. You have the long-term regulation happening in your hypothalamus. And basically the way that works is that your body fat produces a hormone called leptin in proportion to its size. And just as a thermostat in your home measures the temperature using a thermometer, the brain measures the level of leptin in your circulation using... Uh, receptors, and then it uses that information to enact corrective responses to bring your body fat back up if you start to lose fat. So just as your thermostat, if it detects that the temperature has exceeded some or it has gone below some threshold, it kicks on the heat. Well, your brain when your body fat goes below a certain threshold, as communicated by low leptin, it kicks on a variety of different responses that include activating your hunger systems and include um, activating your food motivation systems. So you're going to crave more, you're going to be more hungry, you're going to respond more to visual and smell cues of food, um, you're going to think more about food. And then... On the other side, it starts to lower your metabolic rate and make you perhaps feel colder and less interested in physical activity. So it's trying to bring more energy into your body and try to allow less energy to leave your body in order to restore your lost fat. And this is really the key reason, or I should say one of two really key reasons why fat loss is so difficult. The other one just being that we have our habits and... Uh, we don't like to stick to weight loss diets. <laughs> um, and so the, the these two systems are integrated with one another. So basically the long-term system, the lipostat, sets the gain on the short-term system. And so basically it tells the short-term system how much food it should require to achieve that state of fullness. So if you're... Let's say you've lost weight, your leptin's gone down, your lipostat has activated a starvation response. It's going to, through its communications with the brainstem, it's going to say, hey, you're going you're gonna to need to eat 50% more food at each meal to achieve that comfortable feeling of satiety. And if you don't, you're still going to be hungry. That's part of the way that the brain tries to restore lost body fat. And so... This is a very important system, I think, for anyone who's trying to modify their body fatness to understand um, that you're actually fighting against this regulatory system. However, that set point is not rigid. It can be, it, it depends to some extent on 
uh, the circumstances of your life and of your diet. And so we don't have a lot of definitive information about how you can modify the set point around which the lipostat regulates your body fatness, but we do have some, I would say, pretty suggestive cues, um, or sorry, clues, pretty suggestive clues. One of them is that if you tend to eat a uh, lower palatability, low reward, lower calorie density diet, that tends to make the lipostat defend a lower level of body fatness. So we can see this in rodents. Um, it's very easy to demonstrate in rodents that they will defend different levels of body fatness against changes depending on the dietary context you place them in. So it seems to respond to diet. Um, also, higher physical activity seems to lower the set point, at least in some people. Uh, better sleep, better stress management. Those are all things that uh, there's at least strong uh, indirect evidence that the set point can be modified. So finally, to finish off, what are some practical applications that, uh, that we can do to prevent ourselves from uh, overeating, whatever that may be for each of us as an individual? Yeah, I tend to look at things from the perspective of these non-conscious brain circuits. And I think that the uh, path to sustainably managing your eating behavior is to give them the right cues, essentially, because these systems are very responsive to the cues that they're receiving from inside and outside your body. You can't directly control the activity of these circuits, but you can indirectly control them by giving them the right cues. And, you know, this translates to uh, some advice that I think some of which is actually just pretty common sense, but also pretty important. So it may not be exciting, but I think some of these things are the places where you're going to get most of the value out of um, modifying diet and lifestyle. So two things that I really like to focus on. One is your food environment. So you can have a diet that's relatively healthy, but if you're surrounded by tempting, tempting foods all day, you're going to tend to eat too much. And so controlling the cues that you're giving to those circuits that are regulating your eating motivation, your reward and your cravings and your uh, hunger and your economic drives, regulating the cues that you're feeding those circuits will help to control the activity of those circuits. So in your home and at work, not having food on the counter, not having visible food, not having things that you can just grab easily and eat, creating small effort barriers like um, having nuts in shells or fruit that you have to peel, like oranges, just little things like that that help to align your eating behavior with your true needs or the needs that you want yourself to have. Um, so the food environment, I think, is very, very important. And I think the food environment is one of the main things that has made us fatter over the last few decades. Um the second thing that I think is really important is that satiety component that we were talking about earlier. So uh, eating foods that trigger more satiety per calorie at a particular meal. And this, this um, ties in with some other concepts, but essentially uh, food that has a lower calorie density, that has a moderate palatability, so things that aren't hyper delicious. Um, that has a higher protein content and a higher fiber content, those are foods that are going to give your non-conscious um, satiety circuits the right cues that help align your eating impulses with your eating goals, will help you feel satisfied while eating fewer calories. So th those are just two examples of things, of ways that you can modify those non-conscious, modify the cues that you're giving those non-conscious brain circuits in order to better align them with your conscious goals for your own eating behavior and body fatness. Right. That's a great way to end this uh, interview. And uh, I only got uh, a few rapid fire questions for you before we close off completely. So the first is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource? Um, I really like the book 
Salt Sugar Fat by Michael Moss. I think that's a really informative one that complements uh, my own book by looking at things from a food industry perspective. What's your favorite Hungry Brain approved food? Potatoes. <laughs> I think potatoes potatoes have gotten a bad rap, but I think uh, that bad reputation is not deserved. And finally, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Cooking. I think it's very important to cook for yourself or have someone in your house that cooks because otherwise you are outsourcing your food preparation into the hands of people who do not necessarily have your health or weight in mind. Perfect. And uh, if listeners want to learn more about you, you can be found on stefanguiene.com. And that's a bit hard to spell, but we'll have the links in the show notes, of course. And you're on Twitter as at source. And is there anything else that uh, you want to mention before we, uh, before we go? Yeah, I'll just mention that uh, another way you can get to my website is by typing in wholehealthsource.org. That'll take you to the same site. Great. This has been Stefan Guillenet. It was a pleasure having you on the, on the show, Stefan. All right. Likewise. Thank you. Hope that you enjoyed that episode. I think it's really brilliant and it makes you think a lot about why you make certain choices that you do in your day-to-day -day eating. And if weight loss is one of your goals as part of your triathlon, then this is an episode that I think will be very, very useful. And uh, even if weight loss is not, is not necessarily what you're after, just getting to your racing weight is something that many of us want to do, even if we are already lean, and uh, this can help with that as well. You can find the show notes for this episode on thattriathlonshow.com. And by the way, it now works both with and without the www. I managed to get it fixed. You can contact me and send me questions on michael at scientifictriathlon.com or tweet me on Twitter, where my handle is at scytriat. The next episode, which will be released on Thursday, will be a Q&A episode with a mixed bag of questions. So that's one of the reasons that you should send in your questions, by the way, for everybody from beginners to advanced triathletes. So stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already subscribed to the show, make sure that you do so that you don't miss any of the new good stuff I've got coming up for you. Just hit that subscribe button right there in your podcast app of choice. Thank you again to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode. Remember to take their free quick online sweat test on precisionhydration.com to get a personalized hydration strategy for your next race. And use the discount code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps, for 15% off. And go check the tweet from the 28th of October, by the way. It's at the sweat experts. It's a really funny gif that uh, I think will make you laugh. It did make me laugh a lot, at least. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft life.